So I'm glad to introduce to you Mike Hamilton, who has just joined the Blood Water Mission team. And Mike, you have an interesting story, a long history in Tennessee, and would love to just have you spend a few minutes um, giving some background to your story and how it's uh, come all the way uh, to global health. Well, obviously a little bit different from the daily grind of college athletics, uh, no doubt about that, after 25 years in, in college athletics at three different universities. But uh, for my wife and I, who have five adopted children, we felt called to Africa about four years ago and proceeded to apply for adoptions uh, in, in Ethiopia. And we had two children at the time and, and decided to uh, init at least initially adopt two, children, two, two more children, but uh, in our application put that we would accept three to keep a biological family together. That obviously shot us to the top of the list, I think. Um, so we went to Africa in 2009 to get our children, a seven-year-old boy, a four-year-old boy, and a five-month-old daughter. And as we were leaving Africa and talking to a, an elderly lady in the airport and talking about culture and names, uh, I asked her about our daughter's name, which is Kalu, K-A-L-U, and she said Kalu means get the word out. And given the platform that I had had in college athletics, I felt like an obligation, I felt an obligation to, to try to tell the message not only of the orphan crisis in Africa, but for us, the very personal message of, of HIV AIDS as our children actually were orphaned due to the AIDS crisis. Their, their mother, they lived in a two-parent home through the fall of, of uh, 2008, and their mother died of AIDS in November of 2008, shortly after giving birth to Kalu, and then their father committed suicide thereafter. And so that was our very real engagement with this crisis in Africa. Was that something that was a familiar uh, issue in Knoxville in terms of the orphan crisis? Was it something that you were familiar with? Were you, how much about Africa did you know before all of this process? Well, we were familiar with the orphan crisis in that we had been involved with adoption causes for a number of years because of our two older, being a, two older children being adopted and, and interfacing with agencies and, and the like. But frankly, uh, you know, most, most of it had been intellectual knowledge of reading and watching videos and those kinds of things. The practical day-to-day -day of actually being there and seeing it was not a, a normal part of our life. And frankly, we didn't interact with a lot of folks in Knoxville that it was. A, a lot of the adoptions at that time in Knoxville were mainly from the Far East and the, and the Eastern Bloc countries. So it was something new that we became aware of. And, and really... Uh, there was a book in particular that, that draw, drew our attention to it, and it was by Melissa Faye Green, There's No Me Without You, and many of you may have read that book, and if you haven't, you ought to. It's a 400-page book, but it's about the, the HIV-AIDS crisis and the orphan crisis in Ethiopia specifically. And what kind of conversations did you and your wife have when you first heard that one of, the, one of your children was HIV positive? How did you process that? Yeah, you know, uh, we knew that there was a possibility that, that that would be part of the story, given the fact that 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 is one of the leading causes of the crisis, there, the orphan crisis there in Ethiopia specifically. And so when we were called and, and told that we had the opportunity to adopt these three children and, and that the youngest was HIV positive, uh, we knew that that was a possibility. But we, we frankly knew very little about it. I'm 49 years old this year. Uh, you can imagine that my view of HIV AIDS was, was largely driven by what I'd seen on television in America, the Magic Johnson announcements and those kinds of things. And so it became time to, to dive deeper into that. And we, we were fortunate to be connected to a number of individuals through our agency at the time who gave us contacts to talk to and, uh, and, and to interview and to ask good questions. We, we actually met with the infectious disease doctor at Children's Hospital in Knoxville. And, and we felt from those conversations that that uh, this was something that we were, we were ready to move forward with. We had the opportunity to, to deal with this from, from our family's perspective and our faith perspective. And, and so um, I share the story of, of living in Tennessee. If you have a pool and it's not heated, in the month of April, a lot of times we can have some really warm days. And you want the refreshing nature of, of the diving into the pool, but it's really, you know it's going to be shockingly cold when you first dive in. But if you do get in, you achieve some level of comfort fairly quickly. And so for us, this was that same analogy. It was trying to decide where we're going to dive into this pool, this, this frigid decision in some ways in so many eyes. And, but I can tell you that once we dove into the pool, that has, has become a refreshing swim and becomes more so every day. I think what's amazing is that you and your family have decided to actually follow through on Kalu's name, which is to get the word out. Um, obviously through a 
career transition and everything, what's the conversation been among your family about how to talk about having a daughter who's HIV positive to other people? Yeah, that's, you know, that's obviously one of those things that uh, we don't take lightly because, uh, you know, our, all of our medical issues are, are private and uh, unique to our own persons, our own self. But, but we feel like that uh, we have a call because of, again, platform, but also the, the way that we entered into this equation and the information that we found out and, and who Kalu is as an individual, that we share that. We, we uh, share it openly with folks primarily as a way to help people understand that, that uh, this child and these children are to be loved. Uh, they, particularly with, in, when you're talking about infants who are HIV positive, they came into this world and, and have this situation through no fault of their own. And we want to be part of the equation of engaging people in conversation and talking about how to deal with it face-to-face in a real world, in our world every day, but also what can we do through conversation to encourage and support other organizations as they not only try to deal with those who have it, but to solve, ultimately, hopefully solve the, the, the crisis issue. I think it's interesting to be in a room full of people who have an interest in global health issues, um, but also in a community that may not be as aware of it. And I'd love for you to just tell a little bit about what it's been like to engage Knoxville um, and your community in these issues. Well, um, it's been it's been fun uh, in a lot of ways because um, I don't say that I'm some kind of shock jock or anything like that, but I, I, I've had the opportunity to say, here's our story of our children, and, and they are AIDS orphans, and, and our youngest is HIV positive, and, um, and we see that we've had an opportunity to educate the folks that we've been around in that, and, and you know full well, we, we established a, a foundation when we returned from Africa called the Kalu Grace Foundation. Grace is the middle name of our oldest daughter, and it's dedicated to causes of adoption issues in America and worldwide, and orphan crisis issues worldwide, and, and started a fundraiser in Knoxville with the, with the thought process that we would um, intentionally talk about these issues with Knoxvillians and, and very publicly so, both in newspaper and print, uh, media and those kinds of things. And we were fortunate enough to have an ABC crew go with us to Africa with Blood Water last year, and they documented that over a full week's uh, time. And I think it brought attention not only to the HIV AIDS crisis in Africa, but to the water crisis as well. And, and, and there are more people today that know about that because of the, the avenue that we had been given there. And it seems like, you know, fast forward now, you're here with Blow Water Mission since November. Um, you were serving as a board member before that, but now full-time in it. Um, what, has the, what has the experience been like fundraising for something that's 6,000 miles away versus for the University of Tennessee? No different. No different. No. I, I think that, you know, uh, my background actually was in development, and what I would tell you from those years of experience is that people want to be associated with the opportunity to make an impact, and they want to be associated with an opportunity to, to have change, come uh, to affect change. They want to be associated with people. They want to have relationships. And so uh, my job at the University of Tennessee as a related development was to talk about that and engage people in conversation and in relationship with the opportunity to transform lives or transform a campus or transform an athletic program. So my, my job here is much the same, in, in, but, in, but also some differences in that we're now trying to engage people in this conversation about a world that's 6,000 miles away that maybe you don't hear about or talk about every day. How do we bring that message home to them and establish a relationship and deliver the message to them in such a way that they want to engage and be a part of it? And we're so blessed in America, and, and I think, and I'll say this the wrong way, Jen, and you can correct me, but Bono said it was a, it's a longitude and latitude issue. You know, we're blessed to live where we, we live and to be born where we lived, and others perhaps weren't as fortunate in that regard. So what are we going to do? We're going to sit idly by and just watch it on television or read the articles and do nothing, or are we going to act? And, you know, our, one of our concepts with Blood Water is it's, it's changing the concept of neighbor. I believe that charity and neighbor does not end at the city limits anymore. It doesn't end at your, your neighborhood. Uh, we, we're a worldwide society now with the technology that we've been given. And so as it relates to development, what we're trying to do is, is call on those folks that we know that but trust in us and build relationships and tell a message that has been already well documented in some ways. Uh, and for Blood Water in particular, we have substance that we can show them of our actions that are occurring with our partners and friends in Africa and ask them to walk alongside of us. And that you can truly make a difference for, relatively speaking, based upon American dollars, uh, 
pennies on the dollar, so to speak. I want to go back to, I guess it was about a year ago when we traveled to Africa together. Um, what, what did you see um, that you would love to share with people here that made an impact on you? Well, that was the transformational experience for me, the aha moment, if you will, because uh, I was going through a time in my life where I was trying to assess the, the kind of father I was, the kind of husband I was, the kind of person I was, and, and going to Africa with friends and with blood water and seeing firsthand a, a message that I, uh, with my eyes versus um, you know, living it through word or whatever was a powerful experience. And I think as Americans, so many times we interject our definition of poverty onto third world countries in a fiscal manner. And as it relates to the fiscal reality of it, there are a lot of impoverished people in the world, in particular on the continent of Africa. But I believe there are other definitions of poverty. And, and uh, there's poverty of spirit, there's poverty of community, there's poverty of faith. And as it relates to what I saw in Africa, what I saw is uh, communities, a, a host of communities that were very rich in community, very rich in spirit, very rich in faith. And, and our board chair actually said, and this is maybe a, a little bit bold or whatever, but I think in some ways it makes so much sense. He said, these folks have nothing that we want and everything that we need. And, and so I, I returned to the real world, so to speak, in, a, in the American sense of the equation and couldn't, couldn't equate it with my world t- today and felt like, I had to do something different. We had to do something different. And, and frankly, at the time, it was more of a how do we dive deeper in trying to raise money for blood water or other like-minded organizations? How do we tell the story well? And then, obviously, that led ultimately to me being here today. So what are the basic responsibilities uh, with your new position at blood water, and how are you spending your days? I think you would have me say that I'm supposed to help provide clean water for 325 million Africans and and uh, help solve the AIDS crisis. By 2012. Now, end of by 2012. 20, 20, yeah. Um, so my role as president of U.S. operations is much like what we're doing here now, and that's, that's uh, making sure that we get the message out about the issues that are there that all of you, by being here alone, are, have, have obviously knowledge of and interest in. How do we tell that story well? How do we get the message out more? And frankly, from our perspective, how do we tell Bloodwater's story well? Because it is an organization that has capacity and... and um, and sustainable work going on there. And then to raise the funds to allow us to do the things that we're trying to do in a grassroots way so that, some, that, that our, our folks that walk alongside of us know that a dollar matters and $100,000 matter and everywhere in between or more. You know, <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Do you think your children, particularly the ones from Ethiopia, have an understanding of how you're spending your days? Well, they certainly know that Africa is a part of our equation now because it's a lot of our conversation around home and around the dinner table and, and in what I do. And now instead of going to a ball game, I'm going to something different. So um, do they fully engage with it and understand it? I'm not sure. They are old enough now, particularly the, the, the now nine-year-old who was seven at the time, that I can talk with him about his daily life in Ethiopia. And he does not know that his mother died of AIDS. He knows that she was very sick. And he was actually with her when she died. Um, and for the longest time, he, she died in the, in, the, in, in the bathroom. And for the longest time, he had a hard time going to the bathroom and closing the door because he, he had this fear that, that somehow that meant death. And uh, he had to go from being a father figure now to a middle child. And so we talk about these kinds of things. We talk openly about the HIV equation in our home because it's a part of our reality. My daughter, my 16, now almost 16-year-old daughter, I'm very proud of her. Last year when we had a fundraiser in Knoxville, she engaged friends that were freshman um, classmates at West High School in Knoxville to come together at a, at a shop to, to make jewelry to sell to help raise money for ARV meds in in Africa. And and she sent up this little postcard to her friends, and it was a picture of Kalu, and she said, this is my sister Kalu. She's HIV positive. I used to be fearful of that, but now I'm not, and let me tell you why. And she told the story. And so we're trying to tell that story throughout our family. And on the looking back at the experience you had at UT, do you have any um, overlapping or... um, experience in the development and fundraising that has crossed over from the sports world to the nonprofit world? Well, I alluded to a little bit of it earlier, but, the, but I'll add to that. The first thing is, in any type of nonprofit, um, it's, it's relationship and story driven. And so I think that it's, uh, it's who you have relationships with and how you tell your story. And, and that story is best told face to face, obviously, when, when, when viable. 
Uh, we aren't able to do that a lot in our, in our case because our story is 6,000 miles away, so we have to find creative ways to do that through video and, and audio and those kinds of things. And, and uh, building a level of trust and accountability. There's a, accountability matters. Folks want to know what's really, going, what's really going to be spent on projects and those kinds of things. So that's important. And then the, the, as it relates to um, the comparative, I think that in so much of our time in, as it relates to being a fan of an athletic uh, program, whether it's professional or college, is about the wins and losses. And what I can tell you from being on the inside and having been a part of the lives of several, many thousands of, of young men and women over the last 25 years, the real story, the real story is about the transformation of lives that being in a university has allowed those individuals to go through. And so our story now, as it relates to what I'm doing today, is again about transformation. It's about transformation in the community, and it's about the transformation of individuals within that community. And sometimes it's about life transformation, and as you know, many times it's about actually saving of those lives. And so that's the comparative that I like to, to go to. And then the, the last thing I would say as it relates to the work then and the work now is I'm about competition. And you know... I'm about numbers, and, and I believe that in this, in this sense, we have a battle that can be fought that as Americans that we can have a great effect on and help to change. We should not go into this uh, lightly. We should not go into it as Americans trying to impose ourselves on these issues. We should go in in partnership, hand in hand, uh, gently and humbly working alongside our friends to try to reduce these numbers and hopefully eventually eradicate this crisis. And so that's where the competition element comes in for me in my transition from athletics to now global health. And it's a competitive market out there in terms of trying to raise money and the amount of nonprofits that are out there. Um, what have you seen in that making the transition just in terms of the competition for dollars? Well, it's, 10 years ago, there were 600,000 501c3s in America. Now there are 1.6 million nonprofits in America. So the competition is very strong. And so back to what I said in the previous um, answer, the accountability is, is critical. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know, it's fairly easy to get a, a 501c3 uh, license and a charter. And I think that uh, we as donors... You know, I'm, I'm going to, talk, I'm going to take, put on the other hat for a moment. And as donors, we need to ask the questions about accountability and, and being able to see the actual productivity and the change that, that occurs from that. And um, that's the, you know, in the end, going back to what makes it r roll, it's, it's, a, it's about people being able to feel like they're part of change and transformation. I think that's the critical factor. You've had a lot of coverage lately in um, Sports Illustrated, the Tennessean, ESPN. How do you think that the sports world is reacting to the pretty dramatic and significant career shift that you made? With intrigue and question, uh, it's a, it is a radical change compared to some uh, who have left athletics. I think that's good. It gives us an opportunity to tell, to tell a story. It's, it's interesting the number of people that are in my age range the 45 to 52 age range who typically are in some type of leadership role, either with for-profits, non-profits, um, who have called me or reached out to me and said, tell me your story and why you're doing this. And because those of us who are in that age range arrive in life at, at some point where we start questioning our own significance. And, and I think men want respect. And, and so um, I, what I found is an opportunity to speak into people's lives. I'm... You know, I'm a, I'm a broken soul. We all are, right? And so I can tell my story from a perspective of, of how it has changed my life and hope that there will be others that want to come along in that story, whether it's actually doing it um, or going alongside of us to see it or donating to it. There's a place for everybody. I, I, I did a video uh, a couple of months ago for someone, and, and we were talking about our story, and I, and, and I said, you know, um, a lot of people look at it and they say, five adopted children, I have no interest in that. I have no interest in, in five adopted. I have no interest in, in adopting three children from Africa. I have no interest in, in adopting an HIV positive child. And so my challenge, my challenge in that video was, what's your Ethiopia? You know, what's, what's your Ethiopia? It doesn't have to be adopting five children. It doesn't have to be going to Africa. But, but I believe we're all called in mankind to try to serve our fellow, uh, fellow, uh, fellow man. And, and so if, whether it's on our street or globally, we need to challenge ourselves to ask what that is. And so if, if by being in Sports Illustrated and ESPN and the Tennessee and yada, 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 can help bring attention to that, then I'm willing to serve as a vehicle for that. That's great. Thank you. 
I would love to open it up if anybody has any questions for Mike. Um, I think there's a microphone right here in the middle. Um, I'd love to provide some opportunity for dialogue. I have to tell you one thing uh, that, that as it relates to this event here today. The, I had not actually started working full time, and Jenna brought me over to um, a global health event with some physicians. Uh, they were having a discussion about AIDS research, and it was a physician from the University of North Carolina. And typically I can leave a room and, and say two or three things that I heard that seemed somewhat intelligent. And I left that day, and the only thing I could blurt out was, there are smart people working on this, and they seem to be making progress. So the irony of, of me actually being here and speaking in this forum is... is um, not lost at all. If you have any technical questions, she's the one that needs to answer. I'm still new. That's your chance. Um, well, I'll ask, I'll have another question. Um, at Blowwater Mission, we've primarily raised our money through small grassroots dollars, um, $5, $50 gifts, and, um, and brought Mike on to help us to generate um, gifts of higher capacity. And um, just interested in the conversations that you're having with people about that and um, what's really sticking with them in those conversations. Well, I believe, I believe it is this, this sense. Of, and again, you've got to remember a lot of the, the calls that I'm having right now are folks who are somewhat in my peer group. And so they are asking about their significance in this whole story that we're weaving in the world. And, <clears throat> and even though the economy has not been good and, and some folks are not in the, the, maybe the same place to, to give that they were a year ago or three years ago or five years ago, I believe that at least in the conversations I'm having, they're interested in hearing the story. And while some may not actually participate, they, they have heard the story and then they can spread it to the next person. And the connectivity has been the thing that's been encouraging to me of the conversations that we've been able to have. And we're a, we're a national organization. Our donor base is from all 50 spa states and Canadian provinces and, and um, the District of Columbia, other countries. And, and right now, frankly, I've spent most of my time in Middle Tennessee because we're trying to not only extend our brand in Middle Tennessee, but also we believe that there are folks that, that are, would be interested in our story here in Middle Tennessee. And as we've gone to, over the last couple of months, to Los Angeles and to Washington, D.C., there is equal interest in what we're doing in those other places as well. But the encouraging thing to me has been the interest here in Nashville. And, and part of that is, you know, part of it may be that we have a very strong health care community in this city. Part of it may be that we, uh, there's a very strong faith component to being in Middle Tennessee. But I think that in general, because we are living in a worldwide society, as I referenced earlier, that is spurring other people, spurring people to ask broader questions uh, beyond Davidson County and Williamson County. And that's a good thing in, in the end. And I, um, we're going to keep trying to tell that story. On the Nashville focus, it's interesting the other thing that's really strong here is the artist community, and that's been a new introduction for you, going from the athletic community to the artist community. Tell me a little bit about how that's been for you. Yeah, this morning I took off my skinny jeans, T-shirt that fit too small, and I shaved my goatee, <laughs> told my hair down a little bit, here I am. No, uh, it, is, it has been interesting, but, um, but man, what a wonderful group of folks, and you know, artists are deep thinkers, and so particularly as it relates to our work at Bloodwater, their, their desire to be engaged and, and to help us tell the story. Again, storytelling is so important to what we're trying to do, I think will be really interesting. And, and we're blessed to be in Nashville where we have that connection, and that's actually an asset. We're back to talking about development for a moment. That's, I think you, you actually use your, your, your assets that you have available to you. And for us at Bloodwater, one of those assets is clearly the engagement with the artist community. And not just musicians, but also authors and, and others and, and, um, because of the ability to tell the story. One more question just around the conversations that you're having on HIV. What are the misconceptions that you are getting from your conversations with people that you would love to help change and um, modify in people's understanding? Two comments on that. Well, the first is that I think that we're not having enough conversation about it. I think in America we've somewhat set it on the shelf because it's been dealt with in so many ways as, a, as an, an issue that can be addressed through proper care, 
and uh, clinical treatment and ARVs and those kind of things, it's not a part of the daily discussion in America as much, number one. But then the second part, as it relates to the ignorance of, of dealing with it, um, there is still, and, I, and that's a bold term, but there is still a tremendous amount of ignorance in dealing with it. And though my wife and I have not encountered as much as that personally with our children, uh, our child who is HIV positive yet, I do have a friend here in our community who has an HIV positive child who has encountered that, uh, this fear of even touching this child. And um, that's really bizarre to me in 2012 that someone thinks that they can't touch a child who's HIV positive, you know. Uh, the, the transmission, uh, the, the education about transmission, what really has to take place for transmission, I think, is a message that we need to continue to get out. And, and, um, and I think we need to, to, to say, to, to help tell the story of what's uh, happening. Africa, the story in Africa is, is the same but different. In, in Africa, at least as I sense it, and again, my knowledge on this is very small at this point, is there's this stigma related to it that's not necessarily morality-driven. In America, we, tr we try to drive it to a morality issue. And while that is part of the discussion in Africa, it's not solely that, but yet there's this, this fear and stigma around it. And so um, education is, is key, and, and we educate through conversation. And I think that we need to continue to talk about it, in, both here and, and across, the, across the sea. Thanks. Well, I'm going to take our last opportunity um, to, for our own platform for Bloodwater. If people are interested in participating in Bloodwater Mission, how could they do that? Well, funny you should ask. Okay, so here's a really good opportunity. Uh, we have this uh, 40 Days campaign that just started yesterday where people actually give up their beverage of choice that they consume every day and in lieu of that donate the funds for water in Africa over the next 40 days and we've got an associated journal with that to help you think through this process but bloodwatermission.com is the base, best place to go I do think that we we do a, a pretty good job of telling story by video and uh, when you see the, the, the friends that we're operating with I think you'll be drawn into that equation and to keep in mind that that a dollar will provide clean water for someone in Africa for a year. And I think we all can find a place that we could find an extra dollar to help in that. And so uh, we invite you to be a part of this. We invite you to um, advocate for this issue that's in Africa. We invite you to be educated about it. And there are a number of organizations that, that quote, unquote, do water. Well, we don't do water. We're about helping folks uh, um, have clean water, but through community transformation. And we hope that you will see that our model is one of significance and one that makes an impact and that you'll want to be a part of that equation. And I thank you for the opportunity to share with you today. That's great. Well, please join me in thanking Mike Hamilton for sharing with us today. Thank you, guys. Bye.